Oh, you know what? Duh. There's this, uh, there's this dial that is mic volume, and it... It was all the way down. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> It's like all frantically looking at settings and all that. No, just a stupid dial. Well, that's how it's going today. How are you guys doing? Anyway, I'm Dan, your friendly fishmonger from dancefish.com. Glad you could be here. We do this every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. That's 9 Eastern, for those that don't know where the mountains are. And usually, we even have sound from the very beginning. So, so there you are. Hey, thanks for being here, everybody. All right, let's get to it. We're going to start with a shipping report, give you a few updates about things here at dancefish.com, and then we're going to get to your questions and comments. And we're going to try something a little bit new with the questions and comments today. We'll get into that as we uh, get to that section of the live stream. And then we have a giveaway that I'll go over. So I'm going to take just a few minutes here to uh, cross some T's, dot some I's, and then uh, we'll get into it. All right. So the first thing is the shipping report. Um, I'm happy to say that as far as I know, everything I shipped out arrived alive. There was, however, let me turn down my volume. It seems like my mic's a little hot here. <coughs> Excuse me. There was one little issue with shipping though. Well, two little issues, one that uh, is actually my bad. One box was delayed, it got there Oh, when? Today, instead of yesterday. Everything was fine, though. Um, it was a box of a bunch of, of gobies, uh, Sikiopus and Stiphodon gobies, and they arrived in good shape. So, or maybe one was a Sikiopterus goby. I'm, I'm starting to get them all straight, but I'm still new to all the scientific nomenclature of all the different gobies. So, arrived late, but did get there safely. So, I'm glad that it was a happy result. Um, the other thing, though, is not so good. I shipped out a group of Kyathit Danios, and a customer reported and sent me a picture of one of them that had a damaged tail. And so, I apologize to that customer. I think what probably happened, I'm very, very careful when I handle the fish, but, you know, Every now and then, no matter how careful I am, I accidentally injure a fish when I'm netting it, handling it in the net. And so my suspicion is that my big King Kong fingers, probably when I was getting the... So I, I get the... I wish I had a net. I get the uh, fish in the net and I create a little pouch around it with my fingers, turn it over and put it down in the bag, right? I bet I accidentally, when I pinched off to create that pouch. I bet I accidentally pinched the tail of that poor little fish, didn't realize it, and put it in the bag, and that probably damaged the tail. So I apologize to that customer and to that poor fish. Um, doesn't happen often at all. I, I am very careful, but I, I am like King Kong size to those little guys. So every now and then I screw up. But the fish still arrived alive. And I'm hopeful that the tail <clears throat> that the tail will heal in short order. It wasn't something where it was like damaged up to the peduncle or anything like that, where it starts to get really sketchy. So hopefully it'll be okay. But but that wasn't a it wasn't a good thing. <laughs> so that's the shipping report. But still, everything arrived alive. So happy about that. Um, I do have an update about the import. Nigeria is still. Whistling in the wind somewhere, um, still trying to get all that lined up. So I went ahead and made another order from a supplier in Indonesia. Um, that includes more of these golden rose line or golden denison barbs that everybody wants. So I'm trying to get some in for you. Um, very limited supply, but this is from the the breeder that originated the gold denison barb. So. It's coming from pretty much as good stock as you can get, but only a few. So I ordered, what did I order? I think I ordered 80. He said I can send you 20. We'll see what actually arrives. But there's some other neat stuff coming too. More of those um, Rutilarius gobies that people want and more of the Annie that people want. And speaking of Annie, I think we finally figured out where they went. So. I have here with me my partner in crime, Jonathan, and he's been here for a week and a half now. 
And when he came, he was like, what did happen to the Annie? And I was like, I don't know. I can't figure it out. And so I was explaining to him how I thought they went, how I thought that the drain was fine. This is the strainer that covers the drain and that they couldn't fit through there. And he saw something I hadn't seen before. He said, what about that last hole? If you look there, I don't know if it's showing on camera, but this last hole, the hole right by the strainer, is about twice as big as the other holes in here. And I just had not noticed that little detail. So that might have been a big enough hole for them to go in to get out. So what I'm going to do with this current batch is put a sponge over this entire thing, a fine sponge, so that they won't be able to get out of this if this was the thing that happened. And I think it must have been. So I can't think of how else they, they would have escaped. So luckily, Jonathan saw that and brought that to my attention. So not certain that that's what happened, but that's my best guess as of now what happened to the uh, Annie A's. So I'm trying a new group and hopefully it goes well. Um, that order is scheduled to come at the end of this month and so it'll still be a, f a few weeks before it's landed and quarantined and ready to go but it is in progress there's just one last step to finalize everything but uh, money's been transferred and everything we have a flight but the flight is not finalized so it's not finalized till we get the airway bill so we're just waiting on that so it should come in though in in a uh, couple couple weeks now so that is in progress and I have no idea when Nigeria is going to come. Uh, <laughs> still, still waiting for that. Still trying to, you know, in contact with those suppliers. They're still trying on their end. It's kind of a mess right now with the airlines in Nigeria and cargo and everything. So it's not their fault. I mean, they're, they're doing their best to get through it. So um, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see about Nigeria. Um, let's see here. What else did I want to talk about? Um, oh, yeah. So, I have something that's kind of cool that happened, which is I ordered a whole bunch of packing supplies, so styrofoam liners and heat packs and cardboard boxes and stuff like that. And my UPS saw them yesterday and they were going to be delayed and not make it to me. And so the nice people up, my, up at my local UPS office called me and said, hey, we've got these boxes. They say that there's styrofoam in them, but we just want to make sure there aren't any fish in there because it's really cold. And that was awesome because they were going to let me come after hours and everything and get them if they were live fish just so that they didn't get too cold and, and suffer overnight. So I thought that was awesome um, that the folks over at UPS know me well enough now and actually care enough that they were looking out for it. So yeah, I'm super happy. that. That never happened with FedEx, so super happy. Um, anyway, I think that's it. We're going to... Oh, I do have an update about Get Gills. Jonathan has been hunched over his computer coding like mad for the last few days. So I'm actually going to have Jonathan come, come over and show you the changes here. So I'm going to get out of the way. And just give him the mic and the camera for a sec. Here's Boy. Get Gills. <laughs> All right, you're on, sir. There's wow. Your, that's what you look like. So you got to come over a little more so you're centered. There you go. This is fun. Okay. Can they see the screen? Yeah. Okay. They're seeing this right here yep. and you in the corner. Nice. Maiden voyage. Okay. Anyway, um, a long time ago, I don't remember how long ago, Bob asked for the ability to see all the stores. Oh, can you not hear me? I can turn up the mic. Okay. Um, so still, if you click stores, you get all the stores that actually have products, but you can click view all stores. Um, and this is loading a bunch of stuff, but now it'll show all everybody that has a store. So if that's cool to you, there you go. So even if they have any items for sale or not. Yep, they'll show up here um, and they'll show you you'll no know items. that they're there. Yeah. Um, if you don't want your store published, uh, which some people may not, um, you can always go here to your store info and because a lot of people I think created stores without really thinking in depth about like that would be visible um, you can always click this it'll unpublish any products you have you probably don't um, if you're interested in unpublishing or remove it from the listings and from the contact form so um, anyway that's an option for you 
did some performance stuff and other things, but I don't know. That's the main thing. Okay, cool. So, yeah. Yeah, so the main thing is you can see all the stores there, whether they have products actively listed for sale or not. And um, like Jonathan said, if you have a store there and you don't want people to see it, it's not ready yet, then um, then you can, you know, click that button he showed you and it'll go away. No one will see it. So, all right. Um, and also the website should be a ton faster now. I don't know if you've noticed that, but it should be about twice as fast, maybe maybe even better than that. So, um, yeah, Jonathan's been working hard over there. So I think that's um, most of what we had to talk about. There's 204 people here. Thanks for being here, folks. Appreciate you joining us. If you wouldn't mind, if you haven't done so, share this out, like, subscribe, all that jazz that us YouTubers are always begging you to do. If I could get on the right screen, it would make more sense. Um, it would be greatly appreciated. So now we're going to get into the question and answer portion of things where you can leave a question or a comment for me and I'll get to it. Now, before we do that, though, I want to talk about that a little bit. There's something that I think happens a lot on a lot of social media where someone will ask a question. Say it's a Facebook group. Someone will ask a question, they'll get a whole bunch of responses, which is great, but the responses vary so widely, wildly even, in their information, they contradict each other, it's very confusing. And that would be okay if the person that asked the question knew how to like rank the information they were getting, but they don't. They just get a whole bunch of answers it's contradictory, conflicting, and they're just more confused than when they first asked the question, right? I think a lot of why that happens is because folks often answer whether they actually really know the answer or not. And what I mean by that is there's a distinction between knowledge, which is based on stuff you've heard or read from other people, things like that, just stuff that's kind of passed on. I call this the fish hobby mythology or lore just stuff that we've always said forever and that you pick up from conversations but don't have any but have never actually examined or don't have a real foundation for it it just seems natural to say it because you've heard it so much or you've read it so much it's become part of our truth whether it's true or not if that makes sense and then there's the next level up where someone has done a lot of research maybe they've read a lot of articles or on something say you're into a group of fish any group of fish let's call it i know i'm learning a lot about rainbow fish right now so let's say you you're learning a lot about rainbow fish you read every article you can find you um hang out on the angfo website all the time and you're just inundating yourself with knowledge based on research right and the sources for research can vary it can be just talking to people in a Facebook group on to reading scholarly articles and stuff by like Peter on Mac and, and other um, academics that actually study this stuff for a living and um, so that's another tier of knowledge and that can be quite useful especially when compared to the lore or mythology tier so on the bottom we have the unsubstantiated tier, that's lore, mythology, just stuff that we've repeated forever and take as truth or opinion, I suppose. The next lore is, okay, I've done research, so I don't have direct, ex the, the next level is, I've done research and read a lot, I don't have direct experience, but I've immersed myself in that. And then above that is the last tier, and that is, I have actual experience. I've kept this fish, I've bred this fish, I've raised this fish, I've kept this fish with lots of other species of fish, I have a good sense of its behavior, what it'll get along with, what it won't, all that, right? So that's that, that tertiary tier, that upper tier, that's the best. That's when we can answer with confidence, right? So what I would like to do in this live stream is when people are asking questions, I'd like to try to make it so we're not just giving them lore or mythology. So I would ask, because what I'm trying to do is create a stream where people can come ask a question and have confidence that the answers that they're getting come from a place of knowledge, at least in the secondary or tertiary tier. 
So they know it's not just lore at least, right? There's, it's based on something. So I would ask in this stream that we try and when someone asks a question or is seeking advice that if we are in that lower tier of I don't have any experience about it and I with it personally and I haven't done any real in-depth research and, and that doesn't include just being a member of Facebook groups and stuff. That means like like reading, if it was killifish, reading publications in the Journal of the American Killifish Association, reading uh, academic articles on it, things like that, right? Where there's some standard of integrity on the information that you're absorbing, right? So what I want us to do is be careful when we answer and think before we answer in this stream, do I actually know that? And if so, how do I know that? Do I have personal experience with that? And yes, then answer, help that person out because if you have personal experience with the thing they're asking about, your answer is gonna be so much more helpful than all the other places they've asked that question and got the conflicting information. If it's, well, why do I know that's true? It's just because I've read a lot of experts like real published bona fide experts, right? And there's different levels of what that means. And that term's problematic. And I get that. But I've read enough from enough different sources that I trust um, that, yes, I, I know this to be true without personal experience. Now, any of this could change tomorrow. That's what science is. Science means we're always open to new information that could prove us wrong. But first and second tier. If it's the third tier, it's like, Actually, no, I don't know that. I've heard that. I've been saying that for decades. Um, it's what people seem to think, but I actually don't have any real basis for this. That's what we want to leave out. So let's try that. For the next few weeks, let's really concentrate before we answer a question. And I will do the same because I can be guilty of this too. Let's be really careful of before we answer, thinking, what quality answer will I give? What, um, what knowledge tier is my answer based on? Personal experience, the word of collaborated by several different experts that I trust and lots of research, or just lore and mythology, okay? And it would be great when we answer if we say, well, when I kept that fish, this happened. Or I read an article and it said this. So when we answer that, we don't just say, this is the answer. We say why we think this is the answer. And I think this will go a long way towards helping the stream be, be somewhere people can come after they've been on four different Facebook groups and, and been on a Reddit <laughs> thread. And, um, you know, and now they're just super confused where they can come and get an answer and know what that answer is based on because we say in our answer I've read that blah 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 or in my experience this happened and the in on that note that's probably enough right <laughs> but just on that note let's also answer the question they asked a lot of times I see this in all kinds of social media YouTube live streams Facebook groups all of it someone will ask a question and they don't get an answer to the question they asked. They might say, can I keep like a, a goldfish with zebra danios, right? A little odd maybe to some of us, but instead of getting an answer, what they might get is, why would you do that? Don't do that, that's crazy, right? And that might be valid, <laughs> but it doesn't answer their actual question. Um, so, Let's try to answer their question. Let's let's try to figure out um, why we think it is what it is, and, and let them know that. And I'll I'll do the same. Let's see how that works. Hopefully that doesn't stifle chat too much. And by the by the way, still have fun. I don't want this to be like this is the serious chat. Come here for monotone scientific information delivered in the most boring way possible. You know, I don't want that. Um, so, so let's do keep it lively, chat among yourselves and all that. But I just want to make sure that when people are reaching out for help, you know, we don't know. They might be a complete noob and need just 
clear, concise answer and not get too confused. Or there might be someone with a total a bunch of experience and trying to level up, but we never know. So let's keep all that in mind. So that's probably enough. <laughs> I, I think we've covered that. And by the way, if you see me veering off of this formula, call me out in the chat. You're like, at dance fish, at dance fish, at dance fish. So I get like three orange blocks, <laughs> right? Because I want to make sure I am doing it as well. All right. With that, I'm going to scroll up and see. Oh, last thing before I get to the questions and comments. I need to know. All right. Number one or number two. This is what the eye doctor did to me. One, two. <laughs> so basically, I'm curious which pair of glasses looks better on the live stream. I, I tried, I got these because I was like, well, they're clear lenses, clear frames. Maybe that'll make it so, like I don't want my face to be all covered up. I don't want it to be, I want a little nuts. I don't want it to be this, right? So I'm trying to make it so that whatever choice I do works best on camera. And I don't know if it's the clear one or the, the kind of normal, you know, thick, nerdy, blue framed one. So, oh, which one was one? This one was one, right? No, no, these are one. The blue ones are one, right? <laughs> anyway, I, I will, um, <laughs> number three. <laughs> Wait, I know. I finally figured it out. It's one, two, and three. There we go. I think we solved the problem. Now everybody's happy. <laughs> All right. I will look at that afterwards, and I'll remember when I watch the replay which one was one and which one was two. <laughs> All right. I got these because when I drive to Colorado in the winter and there's snow everywhere and the, and the sun's like low in the horizon, it just blinds you. So it was an excuse to get some cool shades. All right, with that, we will get to the questions and comments as much as we can. Gore Sim, Jonathan, there isn't an intuitive way to get from the store page to the catalog screen. I know clicking get gills will get you there, but that's far from obvious for new page users. Okay, Gore, thanks for letting us know. We will take that under advisement. We will add it to our nine page list of improvements that we want to make to the website. <laughs> I don't think that's an exaggeration. Um, and if that's not already on that list, we'll put it on the list and then we will carefully consider it. Um, and we do appreciate feedback like that. Thank you so much. It's super helpful. To hear from the users what's working, what isn't. You know, the giveaway. Oh yeah, I didn't talk about the giveaway. Thank you. <laughs> the reason why half of you are here. All right, <laughs> let me get to the giveaway. So the giveaway today is for a group of pseudomugils, which we know in the hobby as blue eyes. Um, we also call them rainbows. Technically, they're not, uh, but they're close enough relation that they're kind of an honorary rainbow, and the common names often say rainbow, so yeah, why fight it? We're not going to change that. Um, but anyway, I have three amazing male forcata. They're such a beautiful species. Those are the ones in the thumbnail, and if you don't know what that is, they are these guys. Bright yellow fins against a dark margin. I call them like they're like cheerleaders waving yellow pom-poms because these little fins, the pectoral fins, they're bright yellow tips on them on the males and they wave them around a ton when they're sparring or displaying. So they look like they're waving little yellow pom-poms around. Um, so I have three of those which, oh, which I better remove from inventory before we get <laughs> too far in the giveaway. I'm going to do that right now. Um, I don't think I did that. Anyway, I have three of those, and that's not quite enough to fill a box for a giveaway, so I thought I would combine that with three of these, which is Pseudomugil signifer. 
And this is a really good representation of what the ones I send you will look like. They look very much like this right here. Or this. That's, that's very close. So that is what I will send you. Three of each. So you will have kind of a, an amazing looking uh, little nano fish display. So if you would like to be entered to win that, then type hashtag blue eyes, plural, B-L-U-E-E-Y-E-S, blue eyes, in the chat, and you'll automatically be entered to win. While I madly go to my store items here on Get Gills, let me show you how we do this, um, for Kata and deactivate those <laughs> so no one can buy them during the live stream because that would be a mess all right cool supreme gecko throwing down five dollars thank you so much for the super chat supreme gecko always appreciated never required but it does make the wife super happy when money falls from the sky if you only had one 10 gallon tank what would you keep in it i would keep Fundalopanchax garden rye, which is a killifish. The first killifish I ever bred and raised successfully when I was first getting into fish as a teenager, and this is what they look like. They are an absolutely stunning fish, hardy, easy to breed, beautiful. Um, the only thing about them is they jump like crazy, so you have to have a lid on your tank. But a 10 gallon tank would be a mansion paradise for these guys. They don't need a lot of room. So that's one option. I really like wild type bettas as well for that size tank. Chinoides, Alba, Mar Mar Alba Marginata, um, Picta, Edithae, um, Dimidiata, Brown Orum, Cochina, Ru Rutil Rutilarius? No, Ru Rutilins. I always screw that one up. All those small fish. I mean, the thing that's common about all these fish, killifish and the bettas, is they're small, they don't get too big, and they're not rapid swimmers like a Danio or, or some of those other fish that just zip around real quick. So a 10-gallon tank, even though it isn't massive, they don't need a massive tank because they're not big swimmers. They like to kind of hang out. So that's what I would say. Or any other killifish. There's so many great killifish out there. Not all of them will fit in a 10 gallon tank, but many will. Chattanooga Ed saying, cool glasses. Why, thank you, thank you. I, uh, yeah, I haven't worn glasses for about 20 years. I had LASIK when I was in my 20s, but I'm getting old enough. <laughs> Things are changing. <laughs> Chattanooga Ed wants me to wear the blue nerdy ones. Well, here they are for you, Chattanooga Ed, just for you. <laughs> Yeah, I went in. It was so funny. The um, the lady that was helping me with the glasses get them fit and decide which ones and stuff. I was picking out the big, thick, framed, ugliest ones just because that's how I roll. She's like, and she was trying to be all polite. She's like, um, yeah, those are. Oh, I don't know about those. Those are. And I was like, what? What are they nerdy? And she's like, well, I didn't want to say it. Yeah, but you look like a huge nerd with those. And I was like. Great, that's what I'm going for. Give me all the big, nerdy, ugly glasses. <laughs> fish Tank Barn, you should just wear the sunglasses. I'm the fishmonger, hear me roar. <laughs> that's right. There's the fishmonger, and then there's the uh, fishmonger. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, <clears throat> Merrick Tomshik, hey Merrick, good to see you. Throwing out 20 bucks, hey, that is an amazing super chat. Thank you so much. Always appreciate it. Never required, but every little bit does help. So thank you. No question tonight. Keeping the wife happy. Thanks, Merrick. <laughs> Together, if we work hard at it, we can make that happen. Gore Sim, happy wife, happy life. Thank you, Gore. I really appreciate it. And I say that, but I kid. I, I have the best wife ever. She's so supportive. All right. Thanks for the super chats. Now on to the rest of the questions and comments. S. Shrestha, I said it the first time. Boom! I just left the group, the fish group in Facebook just because of what you were talking about. They were supporting a myth over real facts and trying to teach them like it's talking to the wall. Don't want to listen. Yeah, I, I, I feel you. 
I've been, I am in some of those groups. I've been in some of those groups. So, yep. And you get to the point, honestly, I get to the point where I just don't try to answer anymore in a lot of the groups because I'm like, well, <laughs> this fight ain't worth my energy. So, yeah, we want to be a place that's different. And let's see if we can achieve that. Heather Body Smith, hi, I am thinking of adding a Pictus catfish to my 60 gallon, but I'm afraid it might get my small fish like my zebra and green fire tetras. Is this a good idea? I agree with you. I, I think that could happen for sure. Yes. Um, I don't know how big the Pictus catfish is, but once it gets enough size on it, they're so fast, I, I would be afraid of that too. So I concur. <laughs> Let's see here. So what could you get instead? Here's what I would recommend instead. And not just because I have it for sale. Oh, I don't have a good picture. That's right. These guys were so fast, we couldn't get a good picture of it. So it's the Woodcat Galaxy or Galaxy Woodcat. OK, so these Woodcats are pretty amazing they're really cute they don't get too big and it's this isn't the only they have this kind of really cool spotted pattern on them when they swim they zip around a lot like a pictus cat would the difference is they might not be out and about as much as a wood cat or as a pictus cat but they will definitely come out during feeding um, and if I remember right, we're going to top out at about two, two and a half inches. Let's see here. I want to make sure that I have this right. So I go to Planet Catfish just because it's easy. Oh, 3.5 inches. Is that going to be too big? That actually, I might have led you wrong. That might be too big. But there's a lot of fish like that. They zip around and don't get too big. And like the, the wood cat and uh, oil cat kind of group. That's what I would look at if you like Pictus cats but are afraid they might chow down. If anybody has a wood cat in mind or another catfish that's kind of quick and active like that, um, at least at feeding time, that they could suggest to Heather, would you do so please? Let's help her out. Peplin Creek throwing down 99 cents and not demanding anything. Same with Kelly Foreman. Thanks, folks. Appreciate it very much. I should wear glasses more often. <laughs> Crown Tail Half Moon. Which would you recommend? One micron or five micron sediment for three-stage water filtration? Um, so this depends on your water. I'm, I've been in places with really nasty water. And what I would suggest in that situation, well... You probably, so you have three stage, you probably need two carbon blocks just to be sure that the chlorine is removed in sufficient quantity, especially if you live somewhere like a big city that generally has a lot of chlorine in the water. Well, I think five microns is going to be fine. What would kind of be ideal, and this depends on your water, is if you had like a five micron followed by a one micron and then two carbon filters or depending on how, really how, if your water is like really bad maybe you need to go 20 micron five micron one micron two carbon filters it totally depends on your water um five micron i think though in general is going to be fine and that's what i would try first because one micron is probably going to clog so much faster and five micron is probably sufficient um, in most cases. So I would try the 5 micron first. Michael Meliere, I'm new to the world of gobies. Do they mostly all need the same parameters or is there a wide variety among them? Huge variety among them. It's one of the, I don't know if it's, yeah, it's probably not the largest family of fish or group of fish, but it's, it's one of the, it's massive. And you have everything from stagnant, soft, peat, swamp, black water with no conductivity, basically, to, to the ocean. Really hard, really salty water and everything in between, from brackish to freshwater white streams, freshwater black streams, 
waterfalls, all kinds of stuff. So wide, wide range. However, I would say that in general, you can keep them in the same conditions that you keep your other tropical fish in um, with one thing to know. Do they require salt? There are some gobies that long term do not do well without salt. A lot of your bumblebee gobies are like this. Um, there's several. So as long as they are a true freshwater species, then you can probably keep them in normal aquarium parameters. Some of them don't like heat, so that's another thing to check. But salt and temperature I think are the two things to worry about more than do I have it super soft for this species like I'm keeping um, or super acidic or whatever the true freshwater bumblebee goby right now and I've I've probably sent out a few hundred of them and they're doing well for customers in a wide range of water parameters so in general that's the case with fish clean water steady parameters are usually what works if you're trying to keep a hard water species in really soft water that can be a challenge but everything else is generally doable almost everything can live well in hard water as long as the water is clean the parameters ammonia nitrite nitrate are good and there's not a whole bunch of decaying um, biomatter in there that your organics are kept under control all right all things fish michael throwing out five dollars heat fun because this weather bites <laughs> stay warm all the best hashtag breeding is pleasure it sure is um welcome back from guam so i think it's hilarious that michael flew back from guam and landed after what for me became one of the coldest weeks of the year no, the coldest week of like the whole winter and a massive snowstorm. So welcome back, buddy. <laughs> and the Guppy Barn Aquatics throwing down five bucks. Guppy Barn, thank you so much. Again, always appreciated. Never required, but a sincere thank you to everybody that's throwing money at us tonight. It's always fun. Bunny Viper. Hey, Bunny Viper. Howdy. I've been waiting all week for this live stream. Finally, something fun, relaxing, and worthwhile. Thrilled to be here. Warmest regards to you and our fantastic fish family. Right back at you, Bunny Viper, from me and, I'm sure, the fish family. Fishy family. Crown Tail Half Moon. What is your treatment method for columnaris? Is it treatable in guppies and bettas? Yes. So, um, it's five parts per thousand so that's five grams per liter of salt in a hospital tank and not in your nice cycled community tank but in a separate hospital tank in air stone don't feed the fish put them in there five grams per liter and treat with nitrofurazone and canamycin together that's what works best for me um, if you actually have columnaris. Now the, the trouble is there are many, many, many different um, pathogens, including bacteria, but also including some funguses, some parasites can be the root cause. Um, some viruses can do this. They create kind of like a white saddle on a fish. I, could, I mean, anytime you see a fish out there in a picture and someone's like what's wrong with my fish the and you see that white saddle the answer is always columnaris that is a classic presentation of it but there are other organisms that can do it too so um i just want to bring that up not to say don't treat for columnaris if you think that's what it is and it's your best guess that is what you got to treat for right um unless you have like a aquatic veterinarian around the corner which almost no one does um, so I would say go ahead and do that, but don't get so married to the idea that that's what it is that you don't pivot if it doesn't work. So if you're trying to treat and after a week it's, it's even worse now or there's no improvement, then maybe it isn't columnaris. Maybe you need to switch uh, to a gram-positive antibiotic like erythromycin or a sulfa drug or something like that. Maybe it's not a bacteria at all, right? But just keep... Keep your mind nimble. Don't get married to the idea that it's columnaris unless a, veterinar a veterinarian or someone qualified like that has actually done the diagnosis on it. 
and if it is column, if you are treating for columnaris, don't just treat for one or two days and then stop, right? That, that creates all kinds of problems. So give it a try for the treatment. If there's no improvement, don't think this medicine doesn't work against columnaris, just realize it could be something else. I hope that helps you. And man, if you're, if you're going through that, I, I'm real sorry. I, I know that struggle. That's no fun. Hopefully that's a starting point that can help you. And I should say, I'm not a veterinarian or anything. Um, it's just, it's generally what works best for me when I have the fish present with the, that kind of white saddle, which I would imagine is what you're seeing. Danny Weshi, you put your glasses on and you become all bossy and scientific. <laughs> sexy librarian much? That is sexy professor to you, Danny. <laughs> well, I do my best. I don't think they're thick enough to be sexy librarian glasses, but one day maybe I can get there. Rockford Fishkeeping, what are those silver fish behind you? <laughs> and for those looking for info, <laughs> if they say it came from Banch Aquarium Atlas, you know the info is good. Yeah, Banch is pretty good. Absolutely. However, the moment any book is published, it's out of date. That's just how it is. Stuff moves so fast. Um, these days, with how quick communication and knowledge spreads, um, yeah, the moment, like every book author knows this, before it goes to print, it's already obsolete. Uh, not all of it by any means, but yeah, like you'll read the old Banch Atlases and it's like, hey, that's no longer called that. That's a different fish now. All, it, it all changes. Mike's Aquatics and things throwing down 10 bucks. Mike's, thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um, I really appreciate all the super jets tonight, folks. And no one feel obligated, please, but the fact that money's pouring into the coffers can't can't do anything but help, right? So I appreciate it. There are 258 of us here. Thanks for being here, folks. I really appreciate it. Oh, <laughs> I finally got to the point where people are telling me which pair of glasses. I will watch that section on the replay. <laughs> and make sure I do the exact opposite. No. <laughs> All things fish. Clear fl frames look more scientific. I prefer the dark fl frames, though. Why can't I say frames? I'm like, flame, fram. Can't talk. I must need more drink. Alex, aquatic animals. I'm planning to get platinum guppies. Should I get purple or red dragon guppy trios? Oh, premium. I was like, this is a confusing question. I want platinum guppies. Should I get the purple or red ones? <laughs> okay, I got it. To get premium guppies. Um, you know, that's all a matter of personal taste, Alex. If you're getting them in the hope of reselling them, then go for red. Red sells really well. But um, honestly, I, I don't... I couldn't say that purple guppies are hardier than reds or this or that. There's so many different lines and so many different sources that um, I think you just get what you want. But if you want to sell them, go for red. Yeah, these look too much like safety glasses, says the fishy mailman. I, I agree. Absolutely. Yep. In fact, that's one reason I got them, so that when we're building the warehouse, I'm just going to wear these. Jeff Rose fish keeping glasses number two. All right, Jeff Rose likes number two. Bunny Viper definitely wear the shades, <laughs> and it's gonna jump. Boom. Okay, Chad just jumped. Let's see if we can catch up here. Oh, D from Brooklyn. I lost killifish to the fluoroverse. I'm sorry. They do jump. Killifish jump like crazy. So do most bettas. So, just par for the course. Killifish tight lid. Betta tight lid. Stiff it on Annie, tight lid, and cover your strainers. <laughs> Jeez, I feel so bad about that. Anyway, moving on. Mitchell Broom, are the signifer from the giveaway going to be the Gap Creek Collection Point or generic hobby strain? They're going to be the hobby strain. Let me show you the difference. Um, Pseudomugil signifer. Okay, let's see if I can find so this these are 
are pretty much aquarium strain, right? See this dorsal? It's kind of got a, a normal cap on it. Um, same with this. This is your aquarium strain. I hope I'm not offending anyone that's like, no, I collected this in this creek. I went, I traveled to Australia myself, you know. Um, this aquarium strain. Now the Gap Creek, what you're going to see is a highly extended um, anterior dorsal fin. So, big pointy dorsal fin. Let's see if we can find, here you go. See this dorsal fin? Boom, how big and pointy it is. That's, now I'm not saying every fish that has that is a Gap Creek, but the Gap Creek definitely have that. Here's a good picture. Big spiky dorsal fin, right? So that's, um, that's how you tell a difference. There's other populations with that too, but the, the generic strain just has that, you know, kind of normal sized dorsal fin. Now, I'm sure there's some valuable collection points that have it as well, but that's definitely a feature of the generic hobby strain. Rockford Fishkeeping, why not do funky glasses to match your funky socks? Like 1960s funky glasses. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I already have three pairs, so I think I'm okay for now. <laughs> That's probably more glasses than anyone needs. John Kim, what are your thoughts on using plenums for aquariums? Um, I don't have a lot of thoughts on it. I, I, I'm familiar with Kevin Novak and his channel that goes into those kind of in depth. So... I would suggest that if you want to know about that, you check out Kevin Novak. I think it, I think his YouTube channel is Kevin Novak PhD or something like that. <laughs> um, but I've never used them. I understand the concept though. You want to create anoxic environments because there's certain bacteria that uh, will thrive in those environments that convert nitrate. Um, most aquariums that are aerobic, oxygen-rich environments can only convert ammonia and nitrite, and we're stuck with nitrate that we have to remove by water changes or plants or whatever, right? Um, the idea with the plenum is you can fix that nitrate issue as well another way. But I've never, I've never played with them. I've never had. Honestly, it's, it it seems like in my systems. I was always trying to breed and stuff. I was going more for, I don't want to say sterile, it wasn't like that, but I was going more for simple um, and often like flow through systems and things like that. So never dealt with a plenum. If anyone here has experience with a plenum, uh, let's please chime in and, and, and help out. Kelly Foreman, oh, some of these had questions attached to them, some of these super chats that are just now showing up. I saw the super chat before, but I did not see. Hi, ah, I think I missed this, Kelly. Hi, at Dance Fish. Are you able to get good quality thread fins, preferably single catch locations? It appears no one in the U.S. is breeding any. So, oh, that reminds me. I'm overdue on emailing someone back about a plan. Right now, I don't have any collection-specific thread fins, and I don't know anyone that does. However, there is something in the works. I don't want to talk about it yet in detail, but there's something in the works that's pretty exciting that would bring some location-specific thread fins in if it works out, but along with some other stuff. But I, I, that's, that's all I'm going to say. I don't know if it's going to work out yet. It's very early in the process, and if it did work out, it's probably not going to be for at least a few months or so could be longer but um i know what you mean though kelly yep the thread fins uh we kind of just have the aquarium strain i've never seen i don't know if it's true that i've never seen i don't remember seeing location specific strains orange cones facebook is where I learned that a common pleco can easily be housed in a 10 gallon. <laughs> yep. And, and I don't want to knock Facebook totally. I mean, I bet there are some groups out there that have really high standards. In fact, I'd say that the Rainbow Fish Live group, um, you're not always, you know, it has the all the foibles of any group. Just like this live stream and chat is going to have 
foibles because anytime you get groups of people together doing stuff, you know, there's stuff happens. Everyone's different. But um, in general, the information I found at Rainbow Fish Live is pretty reliable. There's so many people there that are true experts. I, I think I could say that without qualification, that um, even if you get some bad information, you just wait a little bit and eventually the truth will come out. Now, there's also people there with strong opinions that will, if you say, can I keep this Rainbow Fish with my Oscar, will be like, don't do that, da -da -da, or, you know, basically, not answer your question. Uh, I framed that poorly. I did answer the question, but you know what I mean. But what I'm trying to say is I don't want to knock every Facebook group. There are some quality ones out there, but we're trying to be a quality live stream here. Yeah. Crown Tail Half Moon, can you explain treatment of columnaires? I already got that. Rico Stan likes woodcats. There are some that stay itty bitty, right? They would work for those little tetras and stuff. Peeps lost sheep. What do you think of Florida pygmy sunfish? Any experience with them? Yes, I've kept, uh, which one did I keep? Uh, was it Okefenokee or Evergladii? I, I can't remember. Um, I've kept two. It was a while ago. They were hardy. They bred. They were fun. The main thing I would say with them is you kind of have to have live food. I mean, you can train them to eat frozen, but if they're wild caught, they cue in on movement, a lot like Dario Dario or some of those obligate micro predators. So I would definitely have live food available. I wouldn't count on them eating frozen in time to not, you know, emaciate. So it's going to take some training. Now, hopefully yours eat frozen right away, but I don't know if you're going to get them to eat flakes or pellets or anything like that if they're wild caught. Now, if you're raising the babies up, you can train them a little better to that stuff. But if you're getting wild caught or fish that have not been trained to that, it can take some doing. But yeah, that's the main thing I think to look out for. Besides, they are fascinating. And when they color up, which is once they're happy, those males generally fire, especially if there's females around. Um, they're an interesting little fish. In fact, I think they used to be, did they used to be thought of as Achillefish? I'd have to look into that again. I can't remember, but they remind me of Achillefish for sure. In fact, this is, let me just show you this. This is interesting, I think. <laughs> just a quick aside about sunfish. Okay. And... And one more, and then I'll show you what I'm talking about. This will all make sense in just a second. Um, okay, wait, gotta do one more thing. Okay, got it. So, here are pygmy sunfish, right? Cute little dark fish with a lot of spangles on it. Really, really cool. Here's a good picture of one, right? Oh, yeah, there we go. Dark fish, lots of spangles. Okay, then, so this is southeastern United States. Then in um, northern Africa, in the Middle East, we have something like this, which is a killifish called a Phaneus mento. So this is a great example of, uh, is it divergent or convergent evolution? I think it's divergent evolution. Where two completely different populations, um, two completely unrelated organisms come up with the same survival uh, technique. So look at this, look how similar this killifish is from across the world to these little sunfish. And then you have these. Astrolebius nigripinus, right? Same kind of, same kind of uh, technique that they're using. So there's a reason that fish adapt and, and create a color pattern that works. And it's so interesting, that must be a very successful color pattern because these three distinct organisms on North America, down Argentina, um, in Uruguay for the um, Astrolebius nigropinus, and then North Africa, Middle East area kind of for the 
Athenius meant to have all kind of said, hey, this works, and stuck with it. It's kind of interesting. T-Shot throwing down five bucks. T-Shot, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I hope the fish are doing well. Status report, please. <laughs> Mr. Platypus, is it okay to keep cherry shrimp with tiger shrimp? Also, what are your favorite fish, your favorite shrimp take mates? Okay, so if I remember right, our tiger shrimp... Caradina. Um, oh, this is uh, this is showing me prawns. Dang it! Hang on, tiger shrimp, uh, Caradina. Okay, here we go. Yeah. So if your tiger shrimp that you're talking about is a Caradina type. So like this, right? Then it is not going to hybridize with cherry shrimp, which are the genus Neocaridina. And they're going to get along just fine. I mean, I, I don't think you're going to have any issues with aggression or anything like that. I have kept tiger shrimp in the past. They're lovely. They breed easily. They're super hardy. No problems with them. Um, not not here at least and I've kept a lot of cherry shrimp I don't think I've ever mixed them together but I think it's safe to say from observing both of them that you're not gonna have any issues whatsoever and they won't hybridize so go for it now if there's a true shrimp expert in here that's like actually in this one case <laughs> Caridina and Neo Caridina do hybridize like please do chime in but I think that rule is generally um, well known and, and tested and respected Kelly Foreman, my super chat had a question. Oh yeah, I got to that finally, thank you, yeah. So, sorry Kelly, so, I don't know why, but over here, this area doesn't always work well. And it's probably because when I saw yours, it, it was probably like that, covered up down here and didn't show me. I couldn't scroll far enough for it to finally go like that. So, yeah, sorry I, uh, sorry I missed that. But I'm glad we did get to it eventually. Um, all right. So we have 276 people here. So I want to reiterate something because this is um, a lot of people have joined since I talked about it. Just that please make sure we want this to be a place where people can get valuable information. So if someone asks a question or has a comment um, in the chat that you want to respond to, please respond. But take a moment before you do to ask the question, do I actually know this answer? Do I know this from personal experience? If so, say, yeah, in my experience, this happened. Um, have you done a ton of research and read lots of experts that talk about something? So you're like, hey, based on my research, I think this. Or is it just lore and myth that you've heard and is, is kind of just something that's been repeated for years and years? That, but maybe on thinking about it a little deeper, maybe it's like, hey, actually, I don't know if that's true. I don't have experience with it and I haven't done a lot of research and, and read from scholarly papers or experts in the, that area. Um, about it so we're trying to make this a place where people can get valuable information that is actionable without getting confused with a lot of ton of just lore and myth thrown at them um, and if two people have different experience that happens all the time that kind of confusion is absolutely valid um, you take a fish in one tank it'll act one way you move it and put it into another tank that's set up differently, it can act completely differently. So it's not like there can't be contradiction, but we're trying to make the answers quality so that people asking them can have some confidence that the information they're getting is, is worth seriously considering. So I would just ask before you jump in and answer anyone's question or comment, um, did you think about that? Is my answer actually based on something I'm confident in? And if not, maybe refrain from answering or maybe say, well, here's what everyone says, but I don't know if it's true, right? Okay, now what I would like to do, we have 275 people here, is go ahead and do the giveaway early to kind of reward folks that don't just pop in at the end hoping to get some free stuff. So all you folks that are here at 8.01 p.m. Mountain Time, um, this drawing is for three male Pseudomugil furcatus and three male pseudomugil signifers. So a nice little group of nanofish. They'll get along fine. Um, they'll do great in like with other nanofish and be, be really pretty. So 
the winner of that is Mitchell Broom. Mitchell Broom, you have won. Congratulations. If you would just chime in, you've got a minute and a half to say, I'm here, or wow, or yippee, or hooray, or whatever, but to let us know that you're here, because you do have to be present to win. And um, we'll go on how to claim your winnings once you chime in. Let me get to the next one here. All right. Crown Tail Half Moon, thank you. I'll use 5 micron. Yes, I have 2 carbon, 5 micron following. Water is good, okay for particles and color. Um, you might want to consider Crown Tail putting the 5 micron before the carbon. So sediment first, then carbon. It'll just help your carbon last longer. And since that's super important in order to keep the carbon active and getting the chlorine out and efficient at that, it's probably worth considering taking the sediment out before the carbon blocks. So, Oh, okay, so Mitchell's saying, while I love that I won, can you pick someone else? I have the Gap Creek signifiers and I don't want to mix them. Someone else can enjoy them. Okay, good point. Good point, absolutely. So the winner now is Because You're Fish. Because You're Fish, come on down, you have won, which is nice because because your fish uh, provided a giveaway a while ago, so now they get to win. Awesome, so now you have a minute and a half to claim your winnings. And Mitchell, I, I totally understand that. Yeah, I appreciate that. All right, Rockford Fishkeeping, did you hear about the hacker that tried to poison the city water and lie in Florida from 100 ppm to 11,100 ppm? Whew. Luckily, employees saw it happening and fixed it. Yeah, I, I didn't read the article, but it did pop up in my news feed that something had happened um, in Florida that someone tried to poison the water. Ugh. I don't even want to think about it. That's just, yeah, that's horrible. Oh, hey, it looks like, because you're fish, you're getting close. You got 30 more seconds. It looks like Guppy Barn Aquatics huh? had a comment, too, that I didn't see earlier. So Guppy Barn Aquatics, thank you for helping me last week about shipping and how to best ship fish. I watch all your videos, and you've done so much to advance the hobby. Hey, you're welcome. I'm happy to help. Honestly, I mean that sincerely. I, I want to help people be successful shipping fish because I think it's important. Um, there's so many folks that live in areas that they don't have... Uh, a mom and pop or brick and mortar store that they can access at all in some cases or they carry the type of fish that they're interested in and so I think as you advance in the hobby the only way to get a lot of stuff that you might be interested in is having it sent to you so I think we need to get good at that so that people can have success getting the things that they're interested in because that's what makes the hobby strong and keeps people from dropping out right so I am sincerely happy to help Danny Weshi, how can you tell if you have true freshwater bumblebee gobies or normal brackish bumblebee gobies? So, um, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a hard one to answer if it's just by looking at it, but there are some differences. Ultimately, ultimately, you kind of have to trust your supplier. Let me go into those differences in a second. Because your fish has not shown up to claim the winnings, Sorry, we're moving on. Them's the rules. The winner is now CPC Aquatics. <laughs> so many winners, so little claimed. <laughs> so CPC Aquatics, if you're here, you've got a, about a minute and 20 seconds to let us know while I go over freshwater bumblebee goby. Okay. So this is the freshwater bumblebee goby. This is Brachiogobius xanthomelis, okay? There might be one or two other species as well. Normally, bumblebee gobies are from estuaries that are brackish. There's a lot of salt water going in and out of those, and they don't do well in fresh, soft water. But these, according to Seriously Fri Fish, um, they're restricted to lowland environments, including freshwater swamps, streams, minor, tribu minor tributaries, and forest peat swamps. So they're coming from the same types of habitats that things like wild-type bettas and other um, 
fish that we think of as like rainforest fish, like really soft acidic water type species, right? So they really don't need the salt. Now, how can you tell if you have this species and something else? I honestly don't think you can. There's so many fish that you can't just look out and identify. However, they do look a little bit different than other gobies. So this is a good picture of one of your more common gobies, right? Distinct black and yellow bars. This is the freshwater species. Come on, there you go. It's a little muddier, it's more blotched than barred. Here's another shot of something that looks like that. So it's not like this, where it's very distinct, it's more blotchy. Now I want to put on a caveat that there are also brackish water species of gobies that are blotched, that aren't that distinct, you know, yellow, black, it's real clear. Um, so that's not the end all be all. But I would say if you get a freshwater bumblebee goby and it isn't kind of more blotchy than clear cut, then I'd be suspicious um, that it is in fact that species. Now I will say that Xantho, what was it, Xantho, whatever that was, <laughs> the species name on um, the true freshwater bumblebee goby. That's the only one that I'm certain is true freshwater. I believe there might be a couple others, but I can't say that for sure. And it's the only one that I've kept in the true freshwater category. So there are some limits to my knowledge, but that's where I would start, just visually. I have seen species that are brackish sold as true freshwater bumblebee gobies and when, when they are not. So there is some confusion out there for sure. Ultimately though, the pet store or wherever you're buying them from uh, has to trust their source and unless like, unless their neighbor happens to be uh, an expert in bumblebee gobies that works at a university and can like actually do the fin count and scale count and, and look at the DNA and all that, um, it, at some point we just have to trust the supply chain, but we need to do so informed, right? All right, Wichita Falls, Fishkeeper. Hey, I hope you're doing good. Good to see you, my friend. Throwing down $10, and if there's a comment, I can't see it. Um, hang on, can I see it here? Ah, here we are. Dan, I'm enjoying the L471s. Cool, these are the mini snowball plecos. Super cool little fancy pleco that only gets like two inches or so. So, nice small one. Have you experimented with the anoxic filter that Dr. Ken Novak created? I have not, although I'm familiar with his work and his videos about it. Just curious, thank you for providing an environment for learning and sharing. So nope, I haven't worked with, um, I believe that's what we're calling a plenum, right? Not because I don't think they'll work or anything, but just because I've always been, I very rarely set up a tank that's like, hey, this is going to be a beautiful show tank, it's going to be stable forever, um, let's put a plenum in there, or a sump with a plenum or something, right? Most of my tanks have been like, okay, I'm trying to breed this species, how do I optimize the tank for that? So it's a, it's a different setups I've had. So no plenum experience in my, in my life, I'm sorry, I wish I could tell you I did. Skipper's Aquarium saying, to ask Dan a question, make sure you type at Dan's Fish so it highlights for him. Oh, have we? Oh, we do have a winner. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> CBC Aquatics, I got all distracted. He's like, wait, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Sorry, CPC Aquatics. Um, thank you for um, playing, and uh, congratulations on winning the Sudamugil color pack is what I'll call that because it's all males. If you would send me an email, dan at dansfish.com, if you give me your first and last name, your shipping address, say, hey, I'm CPC Aquatics, I won, um, then I will get those sent to you probably this Monday, I'll send them out. They'll be sent next day delivery, so they should get to you Tuesday of next week. If that doesn't work for you, we'll iron out the details. Kiddos Aquatics asking if I missed Kelly's uh, super chat question. I had, but I think we redeemed that issue. 
But thanks for bringing that to my attention. KS, new pictures look great on the website. Yes, they do. Take a bow. Take a bow. This is the guy that took all those. Um, finally, I, it's so nice to have Jonathan here because he's here to visit. And I'm like, hey, <laughs> here's a camera. I need about 100 pictures. <laughs> <laughs> so he visits very infrequently. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, he knows. He comes for it. But yeah, it's nice when uh, I can get a little help and uh, get some things done that have been uh, neglected, <laughs> like pictures. Hannah D bought a trio of guppies a few months ago. They're five months now. I'm worried they're not breeding yet. My heater malfunctioned two months ago. Got to 110. Ooh. Are the fish damaged from that? I can honestly say, Hannah D, that I don't know. I've never experienced that. I don't know if being subjected to um, high temperatures can sterilize a guppy. It's a neat theory, though. I could see that being a possibility, but I can't give you an absolute answer. But barring anything else weird happening... You know, it seems like a possibility for sure. Oh, Mike's Aquatics and Things. I missed it before. There is a sticker on that. Man, this window is really unhelpful. Anyway, there you go. <laughs> Mike gets it. Orange cones, to pull off the librarian look, you're going to need a chin of beads around the neck. How's that? Am I getting there? Don't you know the Dewey Decimal System? What is that from UHF, I think? I can't remember. <laughs> Crown Tail Half Moon. Do you know how to keep Infusorium Paramecium culture going? Yes. Um, the best way, I think, to answer that is to send you to uh, Mark's Aquatics. Yeah. Um, I believe it's Mark's Aquatics. He's a YouTuber from the UK, and he has great videos on raising little egg layers like neon tetras and zebra danios and lots of other ones too and he goes over how he cultures infusoria um, in those videos so take a look there but the main way to keep them going is you have to constantly refresh them so they are going to spoil you're keeping a, a very instable system usually because usually in like a jar or something like that so you just have to kind of get a feel for it and you'll kind of know oh now it's time to restart a new culture so every few days until you get a feel for it let's say you have six jars you set one up it blooms now you have infusoria I would take a little bit out start jar number two let that keep going a few more days maybe start jar number three right and six jars was too many you don't need that many but the point is you always have fresh ones going because that first jar is going to crash and there might be a way to like siphon out the bottom and do a 50 percent water change and keep it going a little bit but you're gonna have all kinds of population variants when you do that so what you want to do i don't know what you want to do but what is generally done <laughs> is start a new culture frequently enough that you always have one or two in full bloom meaning the infusoria is at its max population um, because they are gonna ebb and flow and eventually crash <laughs> ground tail half moon oh me me pick me <laughs> candy thank you for posting my email and thanks to my mods i have not thanked you yet my mods are amazing so mods thanks for being here every week in Folks in the chat, um, keep in mind they're volunteers. They do this out of the goodness of their heart, so let's make their job easy. Because it's got to be fun or there's really no reason for them to do it. And I don't want to lose them, frankly. <laughs> Mitchell Broom, while I love that I won... Okay, got it. Yep. And I get that. Keep those Gap Creeks pure line. Absolutely. Dude. Fish. Any tips? I, I just have a surfer voice hit my head when I hear that. Dude fish any tips on getting neolamp similis why why does it cut your question off so you're looking for neolamp or logus similis and then it says ban and it's cut off that's weird let's see if i can can i do anything to let me see if i make the chat really big oh now it all disappeared ah 
Hang on, I'm trying to find that. I really want to answer this question. No, it cut off. Sorry. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to think. I wonder if the cichlid shack um, out of Arizona, that's the place I would go. C cichlidshack.com or the cichlidshack.com, something like that. Um, I would, does a lot of African tetras. I don't know how many Tanganyikan species, but I would ask there. And if he doesn't do them, he might know someone that does. Uh, Chris Carpenter has a lot of Shelleys and is kind of like a Shelly geek. Um, and I say that in the best way. <laughs> I mean, go figure. Um, so it might be worth reaching out to him. You can find him through the, uh, what is it, the Great Valley Aquarium Society. If you go to their website, you can find Chris there. He's a member and officer in that club. So that's, that's my two tips. Oh, does anyone here have them? I should ask that. I don't know if uh, Mr. Shelley himself is here, but do you have any available or... That's what I should do. Mr. Shelley, Sean OOTD, if you're here, could you chime in and um, let us know if you have any or know where some are. If anyone knows, it's probably him. Okay, Jerry Serple Morris. Jerry, it's good to see you, man. I hope you're doing well. Uh, please give the blue eyes to Candy if they aren't here. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Oh, Candy, you have a bunch of females? Well, next time I'm up there, I might be able to mitigate that problem for you. Danny Wetchy, thanks for showing me that. I'm not exactly sure what I have. I think it's probably the brackish. I've had them in brackish for like a month, and they seem to be very happy and healthy. When in doubt, all of them will do fine with some salt in the water. So even the freshwater species are going to do fine with salt in the water. Now... I don't know how heavily salted your brackish is, but <laughs> Jeffrey Watts. Mine was sold to me as freshwater bumblebee, but their lines are more distinct and clean, not the broken lines. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, that one species, all the ones I've ever seen are kind of, they're, they're kind of more blotchy and less distinct. So, I mean, there, there could be other species, though. But that's the end of my knowledge on that. That's all I can tell you. That's, yeah. But hey, if they're doing well for you, good. <laughs> it's ultimately, that's what matters, right? Buddy Viper, I don't mean to hog your time, so I'll slow down in case I missed it. Did the Golden Denny's come in? They did not. When might you list them? What will you charge? And how many can you ship per $29? So depending on their size in a small box, which is the box I ship for $29.50, I'm um, imagining that they're going to come in big enough. They're going to need one of the, my larger bags. I can usually fit three in that small box. So three for $29.50 for overnight shipping with UPS. Um, seven or eight for $34.50 and up to 18 for 39.50 is what I can send them for. They did not come in, the order was shorted, but I have ordered them from another supplier. Um, so they should be here in a couple weeks. And, and this is a really good supplier. This is someone that I can generally count on when I am shorted on their orders, then out of 60 or 80 species, um, there might be three or four shorted. So they have a pretty good fill rate. And I don't feel like you're hogging my time either. I mean, that's only the second question or comment I've seen from you, right? Besides this one, thank you and thanks to Jonathan for the awesome pictures on the website. Yeah, he did a good job. I know that's something that has been frustrating for people for a long time. <laughs> no pictures on the website. We have nine minutes left. Okay, final sprint. Dude Fish, having problems getting Neolamprologus similis babies. Oh, that's what the question is. 40 breeder with shells, 8.2 to 4, high cage, feeding BB, brine daily, any tips? No, I mean, I, I would say give it some time. I don't know how long you've had them. They do like...
to dig. They like to be able to architect their their own landscape and change it constantly. So if you don't have a couple inches of gravel in there or sand for them to dig in and move around, that can really help. And the other thing is have like 10 times more shells than you need. So you have lots of options. Those are my best tips. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. If all water parameters like are in line, um, then I would say just give it time. I mean, I'm assuming you actually have both sexes as well, but give it some time. I don't have anything besides that, I'm sorry. Guppy Barn Aquatics, will you be getting any plecos on your import? Yes. Um, I don't have that list in a format that I can easily bring up and share right now, but I'll, I'll try to have that uh, in the future for you. But yeah, I think there's four or five species on there that I'm trying to bring in. Oh, great. Fish Tank Barn says Sand City Cichlids for Shelleys. Cool. All right. Sounds like it was a question about breeding instead of obtaining brood stock, though. So, but thank you, though. Appreciate that, Mike. Jeff Rose Fish Keeping. I filmed Chris Carpenter's fish room. Awesome. Yeah, Chris Carpenter's a cool dude, and he has some cool Shelly tanks. I filmed it, too. <laughs> it was fun. I liked hanging out with Chris. Orange cones. Two of my headstanders are gravid and being chased by the rest of the school. Crossing fingers. All right. We might have some little babies soon. That would be amazing. The Fishy Mailman, do you have any experience breeding Rivulus Zifidus, which is now called Ketolebius? Hang on. Zifidus, what is it called now? Ah, Liamosimian. Oh, they really changed it. Liamosimian is what Rivulus is now called. Thanks for doing that. <laughs> but we're talking about this fish. I failed a few times, only got a few eggs, none hatched, lost my mail last week. Oh, I'm sorry that you lost your mail. These guys, Liamosimian Zifidus, used to be called Rivulus. Zifidius, not Zifidus, I always do that, Zifidius. Maybe the most stunning of the South American killifish. I mean, this is not an exaggeration. Actually, they look better than the picture, to tell you the truth, because the iridescence is not coming through. They are an absolutely beautiful rivulus type species. Um, one of my favorites. And yes, I do have experience breeding them. When I first started keeping fish when I was a wheat tyke, my fish godfather, Jim Forche, had some in his fish room. Um, and we bred them in bottom mops. So let me tell you what the setup was, and I'm not saying this is the only setup that will work. But 20 gallon tank, lots of java fern, um, gravel, under gravel filter, this was old school back in the 90s, and um, in bottom mops and a lot of like floating water sprite and stuff. And just let them go. Um, you can also pick eggs and try all that, but if you're, if you're picking eggs and they're not hatching and all that, then just that kind of natural let them do it themselves method often helps. And if you have enough plants and hit places for the little fry to hide, a few will live. And if you want more, then just remove the parents and, and raise the fry without the parents in the tank. So, yep, that's uh, what you might want to swing to, that kind of natural spawning method if the eggs are fungusing on you. And I'm so sorry to hear that you lost your mail. GBR Aquatics. Can you think of any fish apart from killifish whose eggs can survive many months without hatching? I have mystery fish fry in my crayfish tank. Love the show. Thank you. Many months. I can't. The most similar, I would say, are like rainbow fish eggs. Because they're, they're tough-shelled and you can pick them from the mop and, and pseudomugo eggs and things like that. And some of them can take a couple weeks, I would say, to hatch depending on temperatures. But as far as like an annual type fish, there is probably something out there, but I can't think of it, GRB Aquatics. 
If you moved a plant into that tank recently though, that can happen. Aches can hitchhike over. Maybe it's more recent than you thought. Or sometimes there are certain species that the fry are so small and grow really slow. So maybe they've been in there for a little while and just too small to notice. I don't know. But no, to answer your question, I can't think of another fish that um, has that, that strategy. I mean, there's that saltwater fish that breeds in the sand of the beach at high tide. What is that, a grunion? Uh, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe it's a grunion. I can't remember. But those eggs hatch and go back in the ocean the next high tide. So, you know, the next month, basically. That's as close as I'm getting in my head, and that's not close at all. Oh, and you love the show. Thank you. As Shrestha, black sailfin molly pair losing their color. Is this normal or sick, turning grayish in their tails? Had them for a year now and bred a few times. Thoughts? Without being there, I couldn't really tell, but I'm trying to think if any of my black mollies ever grayed out. I'm not going to be able to give you the best answer here because it's been so long since I've kept those that I don't remember. Um, does anyone here, can anyone here give a better answer? Have you, is it normal for black mollies once they kind of mature to, to gray out, even if they're healthy and have some life left in them? Or should S. Shrestha be worried about an illness? I just can't remember. It's been, it's been too long. Dude, fish, I'm good. <laughs> Thanks. I wasn't making fun of you, honestly. It's just that I read your name and, like, Crush from Find Finding Nemo, like, popped in my head. And a bunch of surfer friends that I had, you know, in college in California uh, popped in my head. And I was just like, dude, fish. <laughs> I'm glad you weren't offended. No offense was meant. <laughs> had nothing to do with you really it's just the name poof, memories all right i think we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up i'd like to thank my mods for doing what they do thanks for being here i really appreciate you guys everyone that left a super chat and man we had a this was a this was a haul today we made some moolah thanks so much for the super chats it really helps um we are like i'm still on ramen wages and every little bit helps and it's all going back except for my ramen Everything else is going straight back into the company. We are doing our darndest to scale this sucker up, build a world-class fish facility at scale, and do this right. So everything that we get kind of helps us get there. So I really appreciate it. And, and just the support, knowing that people care enough to throw money, like that find enough value and entertainment in what we're doing to throw money at it, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Everyone that left a question or comment, thanks for making this lively. If I missed your question or comment, I apologize. Um, and I hope you got some quality answers either from me or from other people in the community that were chatting and, and helping out. And uh, yeah, let's, let's keep in mind, we're going to raise the bar on the quality of our answers and try to make this a place where people can come and have confidence that they're getting actionable information that they can seriously consider. With that, uh, did I thank the Super Chatters? I did. Did I thank this? I thank that. What did I, I didn't hail the Lurker Nation. I'll hail the Lurker Nation. I'm with you. Everyone watching on the replay, thanks for watching. I hope you can be here live someday. But until then, that's what replays are for. I will be back, same bat time, same bat channel next week, Wednesday, 7 p.m. Mountain Time or 9 Eastern. And hopefully, I'll have my mic turned up so we can actually start this with volume. Wouldn't that be novel? Anyway, until then, thanks so much. Have a good one. Bye-bye.